Afrikaners, Wikipedia article audio. Afrikaners are a southern African ethnic group descended from predominantly Dutch settlers first arriving in the 17th and 18th centuries. They traditionally dominated South Africa's agriculture and politics prior to 1994. Afrikaans, South Africa's third most widely spoken home language, is the mother tongue of Afrikaners and most Cape Colards. It evolved from the Dutch vernacular of South Holland, incorporating words brought from the Dutch East Indies and Madagascar by slaves. Afrikaners make up approximately 5.2% of the total South African population based on the number of white South Africans who speak Afrikaans as a first language in the South African National Census of 2011. The arrival of Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama at Calicut in 1498 opened a gateway of free access to Asia from Western Europe around the Cape of Good Hope. However, it also necessitated the founding and safeguarding of trade stations in the East. Very rapidly one European power followed another, all eager to trade along this route. The Portuguese landed in Mossel Bay in 1500, explored Table Bay two years later, and by 1510 had started raiding inland. Shortly afterwards the Dutch Republic sent merchant vessels to India, and in 1602 founded the Farinigd Oostendisk Company. As the volume of traffic rounding the Cape increased, the company recognized its natural harbour as an ideal watering point for the long voyage around Africa to the Orient and established a victualling station there in 1652. VOC officials did not favor the permanent settlement of Europeans in their trading empire, although during the 140 years of Dutch rule many VOC servants retired or were discharged and remained as private citizens. Furthermore, the exigencies of supplying local garrisons and passing fleets compelled the administration to confer free status upon employees and oblige them to become independent farmers. Nomenclature Population Encouraged by the success of this experiment, the company extended free passage from 1,685 to 1,707 for Hollanders wishing to settle at the Cape. In 1,688 it sponsored the immigration of 200 French Huguenot refugees forced into exile by the Edict of Fontainebleau. The terms under which the Huguenots agreed to immigrate were the same offered to other Vox subjects, including free passage and requisite farm equipment on credit. Prior attempts at cultivating vineyards or exploiting olive groves for fruit had been unsuccessful, and it was hoped that Huguenot colonists accustomed to Mediterranean agriculture could succeed where the Dutch had failed. They were augmented by Vox soldiers returning from Asia, predominantly Germans channeled into Amsterdam by the company's extensive recruitment network and thence overseas. Despite their diverse nationalities, the colonists used a common language and adopted similar attitudes towards politics. The attributes they shared came to serve as a basis for the evolution of Afrikaner identity and consciousness. Afrikaner nationalism has taken the form of political parties and secret societies such as the Broderbond in the 20th century. In 1914 the National Party was formed to promote Afrikaner economic interests and sever South Africa's ties to the United Kingdom. Rising to prominence by winning the 1948 general elections, it has also been noted for enforcing a harsh policy of racial segregation while simultaneously declaring South Africa a republic and withdrawing from the British Commonwealth. The term Afrikaner presently denotes the politically, culturally and socially dominant group among white South Africans, 
or the Afrikaans-speaking population of Dutch origin although their original progenitors also included smaller numbers of Flemish, French Huguenot, and German immigrants. Historically, the terms Berger and Boer have both been used to describe white Afrikaans speakers as a group, neither is particularly objectionable but Afrikaner has been considered a more appropriate term. The term was in common usage in both the Boer Republics and the Cape Colony by the late 19th century. At one time, burghers merely denoted Cape Dutch, settlers who were influential in the administration, able to participate in urban affairs, and did so regularly. Boers often referred to the settled European farmers or nomadic cattle herders. During the Batavian Republic, Burger was popularized among Dutch communities both at home and abroad as a popular revolutionary form of address, or citizen. In South Africa, it remained in use as late as the Second Boer War. The first recorded instance of a colonist identifying as an Afrikaner occurred in March 1707, during a disturbance in Stellenbosch. When the magistrate, Johannes Star Renberg, ordered an unruly crowd to desist, a white teenager named Hendrik Bebo retorted, Ik ben een Afrikaner, al slate de land drost mij dude, of al zetten hij mij in de tronk, ixel, nog wil niet zwitschen. Bebo was flogged for his insolence and later banished to Jakarta. 22 It is believed that Afrikaner in question initially indicated Cape Coloreds or other groups claiming mixed ancestry. Bebo himself had numerous half-caste siblings and may have identified with Coloreds socially. However, this defiant secession from Dutch law and sovereignty was a leap towards defining another consciousness for white South Africa suggesting for the first time a group identification with the Cape Colony rather than any ancestral homeland in Europe. The Dutch East India Company initially had no intention of planting a permanent European settlement at the Cape of Good Hope, until 1657 it devoted as little attention as possible to the development or administration of the Dutch Cape Colony. From the Vox perspective, there was little financial incentive to regard the region as anything more than the site of a strategic vittling centre. Furthermore, the Cape was unpopular among VOC employees, who regarded it as a barren and insignificant outpost with little opportunity for advancement. 1691 Estimates a small number of long-time VOC employees who had been instrumental in the colony's founding and its first five years of existence, however, expressed interest in applying for grants of land, with the objective of retiring at the Cape as farmers. In time they came to form a class of Vrijlieden, also known as Vrijburgers, former VOC employees who stayed in Dutch territories overseas after serving their contracts. The Vrijburgers were to be of Dutch birth, married, of good character, and had to undertake to spend at least 20 years in southern Africa. In March 1657, when the first Vrijburgers started receiving their farms, the white population of the Cape was only about 134. Although the soil and climate in Cape Town were suitable for farming, willing immigrants remained in short supply and included a number of orphans, refugees, and foreigners accordingly. From 1688 onward the Cape attracted some French Huguenots, most of them refugees from the protracted conflict between Protestants and Catholics in France. South Africa's white population in 1691 has been described as the Afrikaner parent stock, as no significant effort was made to secure more colonist families after the dawn of the 18th century, and a majority of Afrikaners are descended from progenitors who arrived prior to 1700 in general and the late 1600s in particular. 
Although some two-thirds of this figure were Dutch-speaking Hollanders, there were at least 150 Huguenots and a nearly equal number of Low German speakers. Also represented in smaller numbers were Swedes, Danes, and Belgians. 1,754 Estimates In 1,754, Cape Governor R.Y.K. Tolback conducted a census of his non-indigenous subjects. White Virgie Burgers, now outnumbered by slaves imported from West Africa, Mozambique, Madagascar, and the Dutch East Indies, only totaled about 6,000. Following the defeat and collapse of the Dutch Republic during Joseph Suham S. Flanders' campaign, William V, Prince of Orange escaped to the United Kingdom and appealed to the British to occupy his colonial possessions until he was restored. Holland's administration was never effectively re-established, upon a new outbreak of hostilities with France expeditionary forces led by Sir David Baird, First Baronet finally imposed British rule for good when they defeated Cape Governor Jan Willem Janssens in 1806. At the onset of Cape Town's annexation to the British Empire, the original Afrikaners numbered 26,720, or 36% of the colony's population. 1,806 Estimates the South African census of 1960 was the final census undertaken in the Union of South Africa. Ethnolinguistic status of some 15,994,181 South African citizens was projected by various sources through sampling language, religion, and race. At least 1.6 million South Africans represented white Afrikaans speakers or 10% of the total population. They also constituted 9.3% of the population in neighboring Southwest Africa. 1960 Census According to the South African Census of 1985, there were 2,581,080 white Afrikaans speakers then residing in the country, or about 9.4% of the total population. 1985 Census The South African National Census of 2001 was the first census conducted in post-apartheid South Africa. It was calculated on October 9 and reported a population of 2,576,184 white Afrikaans speakers. The census noted that Afrikaners represented the eighth largest ethnic group in the country, or 5.7% of the total population. Afrikaners make up approximately 58% of South Africa's white population, based on language used in the home. English speakers, an ethnically diverse group, account for closer to 37%. As in Canada or the United States, most modern European immigrants elect to learn English and are likelier to identify with those descended from British colonials of the 19th century. Aside from coastal pockets in the Eastern Cape and KwaZulu-Natal they remain heavily outnumbered by those of Afrikaans origin. 2001 Census As of 2011, Afrikaners make up approximately 5.2% of the total South African population based on the number of white South Africans who speak Afrikaans as a first language in the South African National Census of 2011. The earliest Afrikaner communities in South Africa were formed at the Cape of Good Hope, mainly through the introduction of Dutch colonists. French Huguenot refugees and erstwhile servants of the Dutch East India Company. During the early colonial period, Afrikaners were generally known as Christians, colonists, emigrants, or Inzitnen. 
Their concept of being rooted in Africa as opposed to the company's expatriate officialdom did not find widespread expression until the late 18th century. It is to the ambitions of Prince Henry the Navigator that historians attribute the discovery of the Cape as a settling ground for Europeans. In 1424 Henry and Fernando de Castro besieged the Canary Islands, under the impression that they might be of use to further Portuguese expeditions around Africa's coast. Although this attempt was unsuccessful, Portugal's continued interest in the continent made possible the later voyages of Bartholomew Diaz in 1487 and Vasco da Gama ten years later. Diaz made known to the world a Cape of Storms, rechristened Good Hope by John II. As it was desirable to take formal possession of this territory the Portuguese erected a stone cross in Algoa Bay. Da Gama and his successors, however, did not take kindly to the notion, especially following a skirmish with the Khoikhoi in 1497, when one of his admirals was wounded. After the British East India Company was founded in 1599, London merchants began to take advantage of the route to India by the Cape. James Lancaster, who had visited Robin Island some years earlier, anchored in Table Bay in 1601. By 1614 the British had planted a penal colony on the site, and in 1621 two Englishmen claimed Table Bay on behalf of King James I, but this action was not ratified. They eventually settled on St. Helena as an alternative port of refuge. Due to the value of the spice trade between Europe and their outposts in the East Indies, Dutch ships began to call sporadically at the Cape in search of provisions after 1598. In 1601 a Captain Paul van Korneyden came ashore at St. Sebastian's Bay near Overberg. He discovered a small inlet which he named Village Bay, after the cattle trade, and another Vis Bay after the abundance of fish. Not long afterwards, Admiral Joris van Spilbergen reported catching penguins and sheep on Robben Island. Distribution In 1648, Dutch sailors Leendertjens and Nicholas Prout had been shipwrecked in Table Bay and marooned for five months until picked up by a returning ship. During this period they established friendly relations with the locals who sold them sheep, cattle, and vegetables. Both men presented a report advocating the Table Valley as a fort and garden for the East India fleets. 2011 Census Under recommendation from Jan van Riebeek, the Heron 17 authorized the establishment of a fort at the Cape and this the more hurriedly to preempt any further imperial maneuvers by Britain, France, or Portugal. Van Riebeek, his family, and 70 to 80 Vok personnel arrived there on April 6, 1652 after a journey of three and a half months. Their immediate task was the establishment of some gardens, taking for this purpose all the best and richest ground, Following this they were instructed to conduct a survey to determine the best pasture land for the grazing of cattle. By May 15 they had nearly completed construction on the Castle of Good Hope, which was to be an easily defensible victualling station serving Dutch ships plying the Indian Ocean. Dutch sailors appreciated the mild climate at the Cape, which allowed them to recuperate from their protracted periods of service in the tropical humidity of Southeast Asia. Vok fleets bearing cargo from the Orient anchored in the Cape for a month, usually from March or April, when they were resupplied with water and provisions prior to completing their return voyage to the Netherlands. In extent the new refreshment post was to be kept as confined as possible to reduce administrative expense. 
Residents would associate amiably with the natives for the sake of livestock trade, but otherwise keep to themselves and their task of becoming self-sufficient. As the Vox's primary goal was merchant enterprise, particularly its shipping network traversing the Atlantic and Indian Oceans between the Netherlands and various ports in Asia, most of its territories consisted of coastal forts, factories, and isolated trading posts dependent entirely on indigenous host states. The exercise of Dutch sovereignty, as well the large-scale settlement of Dutch colonists, was therefore extremely limited at these sites. During the Vox history only two primary exceptions to the rule emerged, the Dutch East Indies and the Cape of Good Hope, through the formation of a large class of Vrijlieden, or Vrije Burgers. The Vox operated under a strict corporate hierarchy which allowed it to formally assign classifications to those whom it determined fell within its legal purview. Most Europeans within the Vox registration and identification system were denoted either as company employees or Vrije Burgers. The legal classifications imposed upon every individual in the company possessions determined their position in society and conferred restraints upon their actions. Vok ordinances made a clear distinction between the bonded period of service, and the period of freedom that began once an employment contract ended. In order to ensure former employees could be distinguished from workers still in the service of the company, it was decided to provide them a letter of freedom, a license known as a Vrij brief. European employees were repatriated to the Netherlands upon the termination of their contract, unless they successfully applied for a Vrij brief, in which they were charged a small fee and registered as Vrije burgers in a company record known collectively as the Vrijboeken. Fairly strict conditions were levied on those who aspired to become Vrije burgers at the Cape of Good Hope. They had to be married Dutch citizens who were regarded as being of good character by the Vok and committed to at least 20 years residence in South Africa. Reflecting the multinational nature of the workforce of the early modern trading companies, some foreigners, particularly Germans, were open to consideration as well. If their application for Vrije Burger status was successful, the company granted them plots of farmland of 13 and a half morgan, which were tax exempt for 12 years. They were also loaned tools and seeds. The extent of their farming activities, however, remained heavily regulated, for example, the Vrije Burgers were ordered to focus on the cultivation of grain. Each year their harvest was to be sold exclusively to the Vok at fixed prices. They were forbidden from growing tobacco, producing vegetables for any purpose other than personal consumption, or purchasing cattle from the native Khoikhoi at rates which differed from those set by the Vok. With time, these restrictions and other attempts by the Vok to control the settlers resulted in successive generations of Vrije burgers and their descendants becoming increasingly localized in their loyalties and national identity and hostile towards the colonial government. Around March 1657, Rilkloff van Gones, a senior Vok officer appointed as commissioner to the fledgling Dutch Cape colony, ordered Jan van Riebeek to help more employees succeed as Vriburgers so the company could save on their wages. Although an overwhelming majority of the Vrije Burgers were farmers, some also stated their intention to seek employment as farm managers, fishermen, wagon makers, tailors, or hunters. A ship's carpenter was granted a tract of forest, from which he was permitted to sell timber, and one miller from Holland opened his own water-operated corn mill, the first of its kind in southern Africa. The colony initially did not do well, and many of the discouraged Vrije burgers returned to Vox service or sought passage back to the Netherlands to pursue other opportunities. Vegetable gardens were frequently destroyed by storms, 
and cattle lost in raids by the Khoikhoi, who were known to the Dutch as Hottentots. There was also an unskilled labor shortage, which the Vok later resolved by importing slaves from Angola, Madagascar, and the East Indies. History Early Settlement and Colonization Migrations Boer Republics In 1662 Van Riebeek was succeeded by Zacharias Wagenayer as Governor of the Cape. Wagenayer was somewhat aloof towards the Vergeburgers, whom he dismissed as sodden, lazy, clumsy louts, since they do not pay proper attention to the lent to them, or to their work in the fields, nor to their animals, for that reason seem wedded to the low level and cannot rid themselves of their debts. When Wagenayer arrived, he observed that many of the unmarried Virgay burghers were beginning to cohabit with their slaves, with the result that 75% of children born to Cape slaves at the time had a Dutch father. Wageener's response was to sponsor the immigration of Dutch women to the colony as potential wives for the settlers. Upon the outbreak of the Second Anglo-Dutch War, Wageneer was perturbed by the British capture of New Amsterdam and attacks on other Dutch outposts in the Americas and on the West African coast. He increased the Cape Garrison by about 300 troops and replaced the original earthen fortifications of the Castle of Good Hope with new ones of stone. In 1672 there were 300 VOC officials, employees, soldiers and sailors at the Cape, compared to only about 64 Virgay burghers, 39 of whom were married, with 65 children. By 1687 the number had increased to about 254 Virgay burghers, of whom 77 were married, with 231 children. Simon van der Stel, who was appointed governor of the Cape in 1679, reversed the Vox earlier policy of keeping the colony limited to the confines of the Cape Peninsula itself and encouraged Dutch settlement further abroad, resulting in the founding of Stellenbosch. Van der Stel persuaded 30 Virgay burghers to settle in Stellenbosch and a few years afterwards the town received its own municipal administration and school. The Vok was persuaded to seek more prospective European immigrants for the Cape after local officials noted that the cost of maintaining gardens to provision passing ships could be eliminated by outsourcing to a greater number of Virgay burghers. Furthermore, the size of the Cape garrison could be reduced if there were many colonists capable of being called up for militia service as needed. Following the passage of the Edict of Fontainebleau, the Netherlands served as a major destination for French Huguenot refugees fleeing persecution at home. In April 1688, the VOC agreed to sponsor the resettlement of over 100 Huguenots at the Cape. Between 1689 and 1707 they were augmented by additional numbers of Dutch settlers sponsored by the VOC with grants of land and free passage to Africa. The pastoral Afrikaans speakers who developed on the Cape frontier were called Boers. They have often been considered a slightly separate people from the Cape Dutch. The Boers of Trek Boer descent who developed on the Cape frontier from the late 17th century are an anthropologically distinct group from the Afrikaners who developed in the southwestern Cape region who were often known as the Cape Dutch. As a direct result of the Union, a number of the traditions and values of the Boer minority were assimilated within a militant new Afrikaner nationalism. The mass migrations under British rule collectively known as the Great Trek proved pivotal for the preservation of Boer ethnic identity. The Boers founded a number of self-governing states that were independent of British colonial oversight. In the 1830s and 1840s, an estimated 10,000 Boers, 
later referred to as Vur trekkers or first movers, migrated to the future Northern Cape, Natal, Orange Free State and Transvaal slash Northern Interior Provinces. They wanted to escape British rule and to preserve their religious conservatism. The trek resulted in a cultural split between the Vur trekkers, later known as the Boers, and the Cape Afrikaners. These distinctions overlapped with economic differences, as the trekkers generally had fewer material resources on the frontier than those who remained behind. During the Anglo-Boer War of 1899-1902, a number of Cape Afrikaners assisted the British in fighting against the Boers due to their long historical pro-colonial outlook. As important as the trek was to the formation of Boer ethnic identity, so were the running conflicts with various indigenous groups along the way. One conflict central to the construction of Boer identity occurred with the Zulu in the area of present-day KwaZulu-Natal. Post-Boer War Diaspora The Boers who entered Natal discovered that the land they wanted came under the authority of the Zulu king Dinganaka Sentang Gakhana who ruled that part of what subsequently became KwaZulu-Natal. The British had a small port colony there but were unable to seize the whole of area from the war-ready Zulus, and only kept to the port of Natal. The Boers found the land safe from the British and sent an unarmed Boer land treaty delegation under Pete Retief on February 6, 1838, to negotiate with the Zulu king. The negotiations went well and a contract between Retief and Dingana was signed. After the signing, Dingana's forces surprised and killed the members of the delegation, a large-scale massacre of the Boers followed. Zulu Impis attacked Boer encampments in the Drakensberg foothills at what was later called Blaukrans and Wienen, killing women and children along with men. A commando of 470 men arrived to help the settlers. On December 16, 1838, the Vur trekkers under the command of Andres Pretorius confronted about 10,000 Zulus at the prepared positions. The Boers suffered three injuries without any fatalities. Due to the blood of 3,000 slain Zulus that stained the Ngum River, the conflict afterwards became known as the Battle of Blood River. Southwest Africa Genealogy Black Afrikaners In present-day South Africa, December 16 remains a celebrated public holiday, initially called Dingana's Day. After 1952, the holiday was officially named Day of the Covenant, changed to Day of the Vow in 1980 and to Day of Reconciliation in 1994. The Boers saw their victory at the Battle of Blood River as evidence that they had found divine favour for their exodus from British rule. After defeating the Zulu and the recovery of the treaty between Dingani and Retief, the Vur trekkers proclaimed the Natalia Republic. In 1843, Britain annexed Natal and many Boers trekked inwards again. Due to the return of British rule, Boers fled to the frontiers to the northwest of the Drakensberg Mountains, and onto the high felt of the Transvaal and Transoranje. These areas were mostly unoccupied due to conflicts in the course of the genocide Mfakane Wars of the Zulus on the local Basuthu population who used it as summer grazing for their cattle. Some Boers ventured far beyond the present-day borders of South Africa, north as far as present-day Zambia and Angola. Others reached the Portuguese colony of Delagoa Bay, later called Lourenco Mark and subsequently Maputo the capital of Mozambique. The Boers created sovereign states in what is now South Africa. The Zy Dafrikaansche Republic and the Orange Free State were the most prominent and lasted the longest. The discovery of gold fields awakened British interest in the Boer republics, and the two Boer Wars resulted, the First Boer War and the Second Boer War. 
the Boers won the First War and retained their independence. The second ended with British victory and annexation of the Boer areas into the British colonies. The British employed scorched earth tactics and held many Boers in concentration camps as a means to separate commandos from their source of shelter, food, and supply. The strategy was employed effectively but an estimated 27,000 Boers died in these camps from hunger and disease. Modern History In the 1890s, some Boers trekked into Mashan Aland, where they were concentrated at the town of Enkeldorn, now Chiveu. After the Second Boer War, more Boers left South Africa. Starting in 1902-1908 a large group of around 650 Afrikaners emigrated to the Patagonia region of Argentina, choosing to settle there due to its similarity to the Karoo region of South Africa. Another group emigrated to British-ruled Kenya, from where most returned to South Africa during the 1930s as a result of warfare there amongst indigenous people. A third group, under the leadership of General Benville Joen, emigrated to Chihuahua in northern Mexico and to states of Arizona, California, New Mexico, and Texas in the southwestern USA. Others migrated to other parts of Africa including German East Africa. A significant number of Afrikaners also went as Doors land trekkers to Angola, where a large group settled on the Wheelaw Plateau in Humpata and smaller communities on the Central Highlands. They constituted a closed community which rejected integration as well as innovation, became impoverished in the course of several decades, and returned to southwest Africa and South Africa in waves. A relatively large group of Boers settled in Kenya. The first wave of migrants consisted of individual families, followed by larger multiple family treks. Some had arrived by 1904, as documented by the caption of a newspaper photograph noting a tent town for some of the early settlers from South Africa on what became the campus of the University of Nairobi. Probably the first to arrive was W.J. Van Breda, followed by John Duval and Franz Arnoldi at Nakuru. Jani de Beer's family resided at Athai River, while Ignatius Goods resided at Solet. The second wave of migrants is exemplified by Jan Jans van Rensburg s Trek. Jans van Rensburg left the Transvaal on an exploratory trip to British East Africa in 1906 from Laurenko Mark, Mozambique. Jans van Rensburg was inspired by an earlier Boer migrant, Abraham Joubert, who had moved to Nairobi from Arusha in 1906 along with others. When Joubert visited the Transvaal that year, Jans van Rensburg met with him. Sources disagree about whether Jans van Rensburg received guarantees for land from the governor of the East Africa Protectorate, Sir James Hayes Sadler. On his return to the Transvaal, Van Rensburg recruited about 280 Afrikaners to accompany him to British East Africa. On July 9, 1908 his party sailed in the chartered ship SS Winduke from Laurenko Mark to Mombasa, from where they boarded a train for Nairobi. The party travelled by five trains to Nakuru. In 1911 the last of the large trek groups departed for Kenya, when some 60 families from the Orange Free State boarded the SS Scramstead in Durban under leadership of CJ. Cleat. But migration dwindled, partly due to the British Secretary of State's cash requirements for immigrants. When the British granted self-government to the former Boer republics of the Transvaal and the Orange Free State in 1906 and 1907, respectively, the pressure for emigration decreased. A trickle of individual trekker families continued to migrate into the 1950s.
a combination of factors spurred on boar migration. Some, like Jans van Rensburg and Kleet, had collaborated with the British, or had surrendered during the Boer War. These joiners and hens oppers subsequently experienced hostility from other Afrikaners. Many migrants were extremely poor and had subsisted on others' property. Collaborators tended to move to British East Africa, while those who had fought to the end initially preferred German South West Africa. One of the best-known Boer settlements in the British East Africa Protectorate became established at Eldorit, in the southwest of what became known as Kenya in 1920. By 1934 some 700 Boers lived here, near the Uganda border. With the onset of the First World War in 1914, the Allies asked the Union of South Africa to attack the German territory of South West Africa, resulting in the South West Africa Campaign. Armed forces under the leadership of General Louis Botha defeated the German forces, who were unable to put up much resistance to the overwhelming South African forces. Apartheid Era Post-Apartheid Era Many Boers, who had little love or respect for Britain, objected to the use of the children from the concentration camps to attack the anti-British Germans resulting in the Meretz Rebellion of 1914, which was quickly quelled by the government forces. Some Boers subsequently moved to South West Africa, which was administered by South Africa until its independence in 1990, after which the country adopted the name Namibia. Afrikaner Diaspora and Emigration Scholars have traditionally considered Afrikaners to be a homogeneous population of Dutch ancestry, subject to a significant founder effect. This simplistic viewpoint has been challenged by recent studies suggesting multiple uncertainties regarding the genetic composition of white South Africans at large and Afrikaners in particular. Geography Namibia Global Presence Culture Religion Language Literature Arts Sport Numismatics Institutions Cultural Political Afrikaners are descended, to varying degrees, from Dutch, Frisian, German and French Huguenot immigrants, along with minor percentages of other Europeans and indigenous African peoples. The first mixed-race marriage which took place in Cape Town in 1664 was that of Crotto, a coy woman, and Petter Havgiard, a Danish surgeon. Crotto and Petter's descendants are the Pelzer, Kruger, Steenkamp, and other Afrikaner families. Although the Cape Colony was administered and initially settled by the Dutch East India Company, a number of foreigners also boarded ships in the Netherlands to settle there. Their numbers can be easily reconstructed from censuses of the Cape rather than passenger lists, taking into account VOC employees who later returned to Europe. Some Europeans also arrived from elsewhere in Holland's sphere, especially German soldiers being discharged from colonial service. As a result, by 1691 over a quarter of the white population of South Africa was not ethnically Dutch. The number of permanent settlers of both sexes and all ages, according to figures available at the onset of British rule, numbered 26,720, of whom 50% were Dutch, 27% German, 17% French and 5.5% other blood. This demographic breakdown of the community just prior to the end of the Dutch administration has been used in many subsequent studies to represent the ethnic makeup of modern Afrikaners, 
a practice criticized by some academics such as Dr. Johannes Hees. Based on his genealogical research of the period from 1657 to 1867, Dr. Johannes Hees in his study Die Herkoms van die Afrikaners estimated an average ethnic admixture for Afrikaners of 35.5% Dutch, 34.4% German, 13.9% French, 7.2% non-European, 2.6% English, 2.8% other European and 3.6% unknown. 18 He's achieved this conclusion by recording all the wedding dates and number of children of each immigrant. He then divided the period between 1657 and 1867 into six 30-year blocks, and working under the assumption that earlier colonists contributed more to the gene pool, multiplied each child's bloodline by 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, and 1 according to respective period. He's argued that previous studies wrongly classified some German progenitors as Dutch, although for the purposes of his own study he also reclassified a number of Scandinavian progenitors as German. Drawing heavily on Christoffel Kutzi de Villers's geslacht Register der Hede Kopsk Familien, British historian George McCall estimated an admixture of 67% Dutch, with a nearly equal contribution of roughly 17% from the Huguenots and Germans. Thiel argued that most studies suggesting a higher percentage of German ancestry among Afrikaners wrongly counted as German all those who came from German-speaking Swiss cantons and ignored the Vox policy of recruiting settlers among the Dutch diaspora living in the border regions of several German states. He also pointed out the long-standing preponderance of Dutch women in the colony and the fact that most of the German Vergeburgers took Dutch wives. The degree of intermixing among Afrikaners may be attributed to the unbalanced sex ratio which existed under Dutch governance. Only a handful of VOC employees who sailed from the Netherlands were allowed to bring their families with them, and the Dutch never employed European women in a full-time capacity. Between 1657 and 1806 no more than 454 women arrived at the Cape, as compared to the 1590 male colonists. One of the most fundamental demographic consequences was that white South African women, much like their counterparts in colonial North America, began to marry much younger and consequently bear more children than Western Europeans. Another was the astonishingly high occurrence of inter-family marriages from the matrilineal aspect. These were reinforced by the familial interdependence of the Cape's credit and mortgage obligations. Afrikaner families thus became larger in size, more interconnected, and clannish than those of any other colonial establishment in the world. Some of the more common Afrikaner surnames include Bota, Pretorius, and Van der Merwe. As in other cases where the establishment of a population group has been propagated by many of the same progenitors and their children, Afrikaners have also experienced a dramatic increase in the frequency of some otherwise rare deleterious ailments including variegate porphyria. Approximately 100 black families who identify as Afrikaners live in the settlement of Onverwacht established in 1886 near the mining town of Cullinan. Members of the community descend from freed slaves accompanying Voortrekkers who settled in the area. In South Africa, an Afrikaner minority party, the National Party, came to power in 1948 and enacted a series of segregationist laws favoring whites known as apartheid. These laws allowed for the systematic persecution of opposition leaders and attempted to enforce general white supremacy by classifying all South African inhabitants into racial groups. 
non-white political participation was outlawed, black citizenship revoked, and the entire public sphere, including education, residential areas, medical care, and common areas such as public transportation, beaches and amenities, was segregated. Apartheid was officially ended in 1990 after widespread unrest, led by supporters of the United Democratic Front, Pan-African Congress, South African Communist Party and African National Congress in a long embargo against South Africa. The factual end to apartheid, however, is widely regarded as the election of 1994. After a long series of negotiations involving the apartheid government under President Frederick Willem de Klerk the ANC under Nelson Mandela, and other parties a democratic, multiracial election was held, transitioning power from the National Party to the African National Congress. Efforts are being made by some Afrikaners to secure minority rights even though protection of minority rights is fundamental to the new 1996 post-apartheid constitution of South Africa. These efforts include the Folkstadt movement. In contrast, a handful of Afrikaners have joined the ruling African National Congress Party, which is overwhelmingly supported by South Africa's black majority. Employment equity legislation favors employment of black South Africans over white men. Black economic empowerment legislation further favors blacks as the government considers ownership, employment, training, and social responsibility initiatives which empower black South Africans as important criteria when awarding tenders. However, private enterprise adheres to this legislation voluntarily. Some reports indicate a growing number of whites suffering poverty compared to the pre-apartheid years and attribute this to such laws over 350,000 Afrikaners may be classified as poor, with some research claiming that up to 150,000 are struggling for survival. This combined with a wave of violent crime has led to vast numbers of Afrikaners and English-speaking South Africans leaving the country. Genocide Watch has theorized that farm attacks constitute early warning signs of genocide against Afrikaners and has criticized the South African government for its inaction on the issue, pointing out that the murder rate for them is four times that of the general South African population. There are 40,000 white farmers in South Africa. Since 1994 close to 3,000 farmers have been murdered in thousands of farm attacks, with many being brutally tortured and slash or raped. Some victims have been burned with smoothing irons or had boiling water poured down their throats. Since 1994, there has been significant emigration of white people from South Africa. There are thus currently large Afrikaner and English-speaking South African communities in the UK and other developed countries. Between 1995 to 2005, more than one million South Africans have emigrated overseas, citing violent and racially motivated black-on-white crime as the main reason. Farmers have emigrated to other parts of Africa to develop efficient commercial farming there. There were 133,324 speakers of Afrikaans in Namibia, forming 9.5% of the total national population, according to the 1991 census. However the majority of these speakers come from the colored and baster communities. Afrikaners are mostly found in Windhoek and in the southern provinces and have a population of around 100,000 in Namibia. A significant number of Afrikaners have migrated to Commonwealth nations such as Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand. Other popular destinations include the Netherlands, United Arab Emirates and Hong Kong as well as Brazil, Argentina, and Qatar.
A large number of young Afrikaners are taking advantage of working holiday visas made available by the United Kingdom, as well as the Netherlands and Belgium, to gain work experience. The scheme under which UK working holiday visas were issued ended on November 27, 2008 and has been replaced by the Tier 5 visa. South Africa has been excluded from the working holiday visa program in the UK, Belgium, Netherlands, and the rest of the EU. As of 2011, Georgia is encouraging Afrikaner immigration to assist in reviving the country's agriculture industry, which has fallen on hard times. Traditionally Christian Calvinism of Boers in South Africa developed in much the same way as the New England colonies in North America. The original South African Boer republics were founded on the principles of the Dutch Reformed Church. In 1985, 92% of Afrikaners were members of Reformed churches. Various national Christian events are widely attended. The most recent was held by Angus Buchan in Bloemfontein with over a million people, mostly Afrikaners. The Afrikaans language changed over time from the Dutch spoken by the first white settlers at the Cape. From the late 17th century, the form of Dutch spoken at the Cape developed differences, mostly in morphology but also in pronunciation and accent and to a lesser extent, in syntax and vocabulary, from that of the Netherlands, although the languages are still similar enough to be mutually intelligible. Settlers who arrived speaking German and French soon shifted to using Dutch and later Afrikaans. The process of language change was influenced by the languages spoken by slaves, Khoikhoi, and people of mixed descent, as well as by Cape Malay. Zulu, British and Portuguese. While the Dutch of the Netherlands remained the official language, the new dialect, often known as Cape Dutch, African Dutch, Kitchen Dutch, or Taal developed into a separate language by the 19th century, with much work done by the Januitskop van Regt Afrikaners and other writers such as Cornelis Jacobus Langenhoven. In a 1925 Act of Parliament, Afrikaans was given equal status with Dutch as one of the two official languages of the Union of South Africa. There was much objection to the attempt to legislate the creation of Afrikaans as a new language. Martinus Stein, a prominent jurist and politician, and others were vocal in their opposition. Today, Afrikaans is recognized as one of the 11 official languages of the new South Africa, and is the third largest mother tongue spoken in South Africa. In June 2013, the Department of Basic Education included Afrikaans as an African language to be compulsory for all pupils, according to a new policy. Afrikaans is offered at many universities outside of South Africa including in the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, Poland, Russia, and America. Afrikaners have a long literary tradition, and have produced a number of notable novelists and poets, including Nobel Prize winner J.M. Kutsi, Eugene Marais, Uskridge, Elizabeth Ebers, Bryden Breidenbach, Andre Brink, C.J. Langenhoven and Etienne LaRue. Music is probably the most popular art form among Afrikaners. While the traditional Bayer music and Volkspele folk dancing enjoyed popularity in the past, most Afrikaners today favor a variety of international genres and light popular Afrikaans music. American country and Western music has enjoyed great popularity and has a strong following among many South Africans. Some also enjoy a social dance event called a Saksh. The South African rock band Seether has a hidden track on their album Karma and Effect titled Kamsam Metmai, sung in Afrikaans.
There is also an underground rock music movement and bands like the controversial Fokov Polyseeker have a large following. The television channel MK also supports local Afrikaans music and mainly screens videos from the Afrikaans rock genre. Rugby, cricket, and golf are generally considered to be the most popular sports among Afrikaners. Rugby in particular is considered one of the central pillars of the Afrikaner community. The national rugby team, the Springboks, did not compete in the first two Rugby World Cups in 1987 and 1991 because of anti-apartheid sporting boycotts of South Africa but later on the Springboks won the 1995 and 2007 Rugby World Cups. Bayer Sport also played a big role in the Afrikaner history. It consisted of a variety of sports like tug-of-war, three-legged races, Jigskii, Skilpadlup and other games. The world's first ounce-denominated gold coin, the Krugerrand, was struck at the South African Mint on July 3, 1967. The name Krugerrand was derived from Kruger and the Rand Monetary Unit of South Africa. In April 2007, the South African Mint coined a collector's or one gold coin commemorating the Afrikaner people as part of its cultural series, depicting the great trek across the Drakensberg Mountains. The Afrikaans tall and cool to Urvarenaging is responsible for promoting the Afrikaans language and culture. Divur Trekkers is a youth movement for Afrikaners in South Africa and Namibia with a membership of over 10,000 active members to promote cultural values, maintaining norms and standards as Christians, and being accountable members of public society. An estimated 88% of Afrikaners supported the Democratic Alliance, the official opposition party, in the 2014 general election. The Democratic Alliance is a liberal party and a full member of Liberal International. Smaller numbers are involved in nationalist or separatist political organizations. The Freedom Front Plus is an Afrikaner ethnic political party which lobbies for minority rights to be granted to all of the South African ethnic minorities. The Freedom Front Plus is also leading the Folkstadt Initiative and is closely associated with the small town of Orania. Freedom Front Plus leader Dr. Peter Mulder served as Deputy Minister of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries in the Cabinet of President Jacob Zuma from 2009 to 2014. Only approximately 2% of Afrikaans-speaking white South Africans vote for the ruling ANC. Some prominent Afrikaner ANC cabinet ministers include the Minister of Science and Technology Derek Hainkam, the Minister of Tourism and former leader of the new National Party Mart Hinus Van Schalkwijk, Deputy Minister of Justice and Constitutional Development Andries Nell. Deputy Minister of Sport and Recreation Gert O.S. Chuizen and former ANC spokesman Carl Niehaus. In an online poll of the Beeld newspaper during November 2012, in which nearly 11,000 Afrikaners participated, 42% described themselves as conservative and 36% as liberal. Although social conservatism prevalent, Social attitudes have become increasingly liberal since the disestablishment of apartheid in the 1990s, and in a 2015 poll only 57% of Afrikaners claimed to oppose abortion on demand while 46% claimed to be opposed to homosexualism. Notes